Hey, Edith, you want to hear a really good joke? From you? Are you serious? <laughs> <laughs> I want to dedicate this to my friend Maggie in Idaho because okay. she's the one who tells it to me every year. Okay. Edith, if you're holding a bee, what is in your eye? I, I don't know. Beauty. Because everyone knows that beauty is in the eye of the bee holder. Oh. <laughs> Thanks, Maggie. Oh, gosh. <laughs> Hi, I'm Christy. And I'm Edith. We're backyard gardeners in Colorado. And neighbors. And friends. These days, gardening is becoming very popular. We're not experts. We just learned a lot about gardening from the mistakes we made along the way. So welcome to Upside Down Tulips, a fun podcast that celebrates gardening gone wrong. Upside Down Tulips. Hello, Christy. Hello, Edith. Here we are again. Here we are. Hello, everyone. Hello, green thumbs and brown thumbs and... No thumbs. That's Don't right. be discriminatory. That's right. <laughs> of course not. <laughs> yes, right. <laughs> the thumbful and the thumbless. Yes. You are welcome here for some laughs and some, uh, hopefully, some good garden tips. Yeah. So, Christy, what's been happening in your garden? You know, I haven't done much in the garden. It has, um, I'm just waiting. I'm waiting for... Mm -hmm. You know, I'm waiting, I'm dreaming. You've already done some winter sowing. Yes, said, and I'm going to do yeah. some more coming up in a couple of weeks, mm -hmm. but I'm kind of just kind of kind of waiting. I'm glad right now, folks, as we're talking, it is it is a beautiful Colorado snow happening. Mm -hmm. as, for, as somebody who grew up in Minnesota, and I've seen my share of snow, I tell you, no state has the, has a snow as pretty as Colorado. It is awfully pretty. Big yeah. fluffy flakes happening up there. And it's good for our gardens. Yeah. Because it's going to melt and go d down deep, and it's good for the trees. And snowflakes grab onto nitrogen, which is, they call it, the poor farmer's fertilizer. Mm-hmm. Well, Christy, I uh, have not yet done any winter sowing. I, I it's will. It's not too late. It's not too late. But I have checked my bokashi bucket that... Oh, my goodness. I'm scared. <laughs> <laughs> my loins are girded. Okay. I was a little nervous, too, because... The last one that I opened in the summer, of course, was full of maggots. And, and it was, Edith, will you remind people what a, bo a Bokashi oh, bucket is? Yes. It is, um, you put all of your kitchen scraps and you can put papers and stuff. You can put meat, if you want, in a bucket. And then you make it anaerobic so no air can get into it. Like my sauerkraut was supposed to be. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. And uh, supposedly it turns into a rich, deep black soil. Well, it's well on its way, I am glad to say. How many maggots? No maggots. Okay, good. <laughs> you know, it's winter time. And so maybe that's why, although I've seen dead flies here and there, which is so weird. Uh, anyway, it's beautiful looking. And uh, it's been in there probably for five to six months now. Isn't that, isn't that funny what gardeners get excited about? It is funny. Like, yeah. wow, we are so, like, that is so sexy, Edith. We're, so, great. we're such yeah. nerds, aren't we? We're such nerds. <laughs> it's happy. beautiful, though, and it doesn't smell at all. That is interesting. It's wonderful. Also, I added more mulch to my garlic that I planted, the new garlic. Uh-huh. You know, to try to protect that, because we, we did have some very cold nights last week. Yeah. Um, I harvested more carrots. Oh, my I goodness. still have more. And I noticed one of my Swiss chard so far has overwintered. It is still alive. Wow. Now, I did mulch it very well in the fall. But so that's you could, exciting. You could, have, you could be eating Swiss chard in a couple weeks in March. That I could be eating Swiss chard in March. That's really exciting. Well, you're right that it was. It did get cold here. Yeah. And I realized this, Edith, that there were a couple nights where it was in the teens uh -huh. that I had not covered my rosemary or my my new forsythia plant. And so I rushed out the next night to give them a cover. And fingers crossed. They still, they look okay. But okay. I think any time it dips into the 20s. Yeah. One, because yeah. rosemary in our zone is just, doesn't like that. And two is yeah. that forsythia plant I planted in October. And I'm worried it doesn't have enough strong root structure to get yeah. it through a cold winter. So. Well, you know, I brought my uh, rosemary in. 
How's it's, it doing? It, well, it's still alive. I wouldn't say it's thriving, but it's still alive. Well, you know, I still have those pepper plants in my attic, and they are technically, I think you'd call them alive. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but they're not, you know, they have no leaves on them, uh-huh. and I'm going to start thinking about when do I start bringing, start watering? You know, I've been watering them once a month. Yeah. When do I start trying to activate them more? Couple weeks. Here we are. It's February, you know, middle of yeah. February. Yeah. Things are, things are just about to start yeah. busting out all over. Yeah. And, you know, and typical weird Denver metro weather, it's going to be in the 50s next week. I even think we have a day that's going to be in the 60s, Edith. I've so, seen seedlings. I've seen I've seen growth. Yeah, know. I have I have tulips coming up and yeah. I'm gonna I'm doing slowly cleaning out, gonna start cleaning out my beds more. I'm gonna focus on the iris beds. Yeah. Well we're gonna folks, we're gonna do a whole March to do list. Yeah. Here in a couple of weeks. Oh my we gosh, like it's to gonna do be that long. because uh and March is is a busy month, believe it or not. Yeah. In the garden, it's a busy month. Very busy. Yeah. And uh it's all February, Edith. It's also, you know, Black History Month. Mm-hmm. And I have an interesting musing I discovered regarding uh, the black community who was responsible for many contributions to horticultural, plant sciences, gardening, and nature. Mm-hmm. And I want to tell you the story of Edmund Albius, who was from 1829 to 1880. And we would not be enjoying vanilla today without a discovery that this man made when he was 12 years old. What? So vanilla, before um, it became very popular worldwide, could only be uh, made and processed and propagated in Mexico. And there were people that wanted to start doing this in Madagascar. And Edmund Albius, who was from an island just in the Indian Ocean, just to the the east of Madagascar, was born into slavery. And um, as they were trying to propagate vanilla in these islands, they discovered they couldn't do it because they didn't have the right bees. Aha. Uh-huh. So, and they also found that it was very difficult to hand pollinate it. But when he was 12, he discovered a technique of hand pollination that changed the vanilla industry forever He discovered that you could pollinate the vanilla orchid by manipulating the flower and moving the pollen to the flower stigma with his thumb. Wow. And and, um, due to his discovery, the island that he was on, which is called Reunion in the Indian Ocean, became the world's largest supplier of vanilla. And many planters prospered in response. Eventually... Edmund Albius gained his freedom, but of course, he never received financial benefit or widespread recognition for this discovery during his lifetime. Wow. So I just wanted to, since we're talking Uh today about pollination and Mm -hmm. bees and butterflies, Mm -hmm. I want to give a shout out to Edmund Albius. Well, that was good. That was good because I love vanilla for one reason. (laughs) Yeah. It's a nice, clean taste. I, I would put it on as a perfume if I were a perfume-wearing person. Oh, that's nice. Yeah, I would like to smell like vanilla. <laughs> you would. And folks, if you want to help support this podcast, don't forget, you can join the Garden Party. We have 42 members of the Garden Party, and these are folks who drop a couple bucks a month to Upside Down Tulips to help pay our bills. Mm-hmm. And give us the encouragement to keep going with bad jokes and puns. And uh, you could give more tips. than a couple bucks. Don't forget that. I That's true. <laughs> was at Starbucks the other day and two coffees, 10 bucks. That's insane. If you ever feel like, you know what? I wish I could take Edith and Christy out for a cup of coffee. There you go. It'd be just like joining the garden party. And you, we have fun rewards. You can get seeds from our gardens. Um, you can get a coffee mug. Or a t-shirt, depending upon what level you join at. And there's a link in the show notes. Thanks, folks. And if there are ever words or terms that you're unfamiliar with, you can go to our website at UpsideDownTulips.com and check out the Upside Down Dictionary. You could go to our Facebook page or Instagram, Pinterest, or YouTube. Lots of fun stuff there. And now we have for you a pod play. That has only been heard by the Garden Party. We're now opening it up for everybody. 
another installment of Who Killed Rosemary? Dun, dun, dun. Dun, dun, dun. Previously on Who Killed Rosemary. She was fine the day before. Life was finally perfect. And now, she is dead. I just don't know what could have happened. Who killed my Rosemary? At Phoebe's Phenomenals, they had the latest trends to help make your manicure stand out. I am Juno Halloran, and I am a mother master gardener. Did Rosemary have any enemies? She was one of those love it or hate it herbs. Many people enjoyed her pungent pine-like personality. But her strong aroma and flavor can turn some folks off. But enough to... murder? John Elway! For upside-down tulips, I am Misty Contour, and this is Who Killed Rosemary? After my visit to the Jefferson County Extension Office, I had more questions than answers. I returned to Edith, who was working in the garden. Die! 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 Edith? (gasps) Oh, you startled me. Now that Rosemary is gone, knocking Japanese beetles into soapy water is the best part of my day. Edith, the authorities cannot rule out foul play. (gasps) Did Rosemary have any enemies? Who? My Rosemary? Of course not. Everybody loved her. She was just so stimulating and fun to be around. Didn't you once say sometimes she came on too strong and you just had to know how to handle her? No, I would never say something like that. Isn't this you? Sometimes she came on too strong, but you just had to know how to handle her. Well? Yes? Now that I think of it... There is someone who might have held a grudge. Excuse me. Who Killed Rosemary is sponsored by Antelope Tuomi's Feed and Poetry Store, where the feed is hunky-dory and the poetry reading is mandatory. Use promo code, sometimes she came on too strong, but you just had to know how to handle her. Go ahead, Edith. Tell me, who might have wanted to hurt your Rosemary? She used to have a thing with this squirrel. They were awfully chummy for the longest time, and then they just seemed to break up, and that squirrel hasn't been around in a long time. I didn't know what happened, and Rosemary wouldn't discuss it. Looks like I have a squirrel to talk to. Die! 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 If you have any information related to the death of Rosemary, please email UpsideDownTulips at gmail.com. Thank you for listening and tune in for upcoming episodes. So, Christy, um, to, speaking of butterflies, I have a really beautiful quote, and it is from a French poet from the 19th century. His name is Ponce Denis Ecouchard Lebrun. He has four names. Beautiful pronunciation. I'm impressed. Thank you. I actually looked it up so I wouldn't sound like an idiot. <laughs> But four separate names he has, you know, because he's French and they're lusty, right? They have like eight courses for dinner, four names. So he wrote, listen to this, butterflies are flying flowers and flowers are tethered butterflies. Your face is looking delighted. Isn't that beautiful? Oh, I love that. And when I looked him up, it said he was a poet who wrote lofty poems. That is beautiful. And... What is a butterfly? It is a loft. Yes. <laughs> do you know what they call, Edith, a, you know, we love collective nouns. And what do they call a group of butterflies? What do they call it? There's two common words. One is a kaleidoscope of butterflies. <gasps> That's so beautiful. And the other is a flutter of butterflies. A flutter of butterflies. That's great. Well, I one of the reasons that we love to garden is to attract the butterflies. I have to say, when I look back at some of my most favorite moments of joy in the garden is when I'm out there, maybe I'm weeding, maybe I'm puttering, Mm -hmm. and one of those giant yellow swallowtail butterflies will just flutter through. It's Um, beautiful. Yeah, just stunning. And we're losing um, quite a few butterflies. There used to be a billion 
monarch butterflies. Mm-hmm. And now they say they're about 35 million. So uh, there is an organization called the Live Monarch Foundation, and they're trying to save the butterflies. And folks, if you send a self-addressed stamped envelope to the Live Monarch Foundation, they will send you milkweed seeds that are native to your area. Oh, that's cool. Isn't that cool? For free. Because their mission is to save. And milkweed is the only thing that uh, monarch caterpillars eat. It is the only plant. And it's one of those very interesting symbiotic relationships Mm -hmm. in the plant and animal world. Mm -hmm. I find like, you know, like, like you know, like panda bears and eucalyptus leaves, right? Right, right. They have this really important relationship because um, of the pollination that the butterfly will do to the milkweed mm-hmm. and the nutrients that the milkweed will provide the monarch's babies. It's Should I give the address for people who oh, yeah. write this? Yeah. Okay. Live Monarch, P.O. Box 1339, Blairsville, Georgia, 30514. And if you didn't get that, just Google Live Monarch Foundation. And we'll put a link in the show notes, Edith. Good. That's a good idea. You know, last year I had one monarch in my yard. Me too. I bet it was the same one. I bet it was. Because <laughs> folks only had think, one. If folks don't remember this, Edith and I just live a couple blocks from each mm-hmm. other. And sometimes we're amazed about how different our gardens can be, but also how similar yeah. they yeah. could be. And a baby that was the same. Was it in the fall? Uh-huh. It could have yeah, been the I very was... same one. Yeah. Oh, and my I, Christy, I have so many milkweed out in the front. Um, they've seeded themselves, uh-huh. and yet still just one. Well, maybe we'll get more. I do get a lot of other butterflies, well, especially the yellow swallowtail. Yeah, lots of I those. I will get in there. Yeah. I will also get the black swallowtail. Do you ever get that one in your yard, Edith? Once in a while, yes. And um, I'll get... Um, and some people don't like these, but I like them because I think they're goofy. The little tiny ones. The white, um, yeah. the white cabbage. I think are they called cabbage butterflies? I think they are. They're all over. They're, they're white so with like many purple, and I think they're not supposed to be good for your cabbage. And then um, <laughs> I'll also get painted ladies. Do you get those? Yes. They look like I guess you just call them. They look like a smaller um, monarch butterfly, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and do you remember this in October two thousand seventeen, where there was you know just a cycle of painted lady butterflies there were so there was a, such a huge swarm or flutter or kaleidoscope of painted lady butterflies that it showed up on meteorological radar wow. and it looked like a cloud wow. i had so many of those in my yard that it 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 was on the borderline of this is so cool to this is a little creepy. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's talk about let's talk about um, how we attract butterflies and how we keep them. Well, one thing I learned, Edith, about butterflies is that they um, they like bright colors. Yes, they do. Mm-hmm. So uh, the brighter colors that you have, you that those are the ones that they like. They also like flowers that are scented, which means you might have to go heirloom. Rather than a lot of the hybrid roses and stuff mm-hmm. had had the scent bred out of them. That's so true. Yeah. Um, that uh, certain plants I know that butterflies like would be uh, black eyed Susans, Joe pie weeds, marigolds. I know the yellow swallowtail love my purple cone flowers, mm-hmm. uh, yeah. also known as echinacea. They love salvias and zinnias. They like anything. I mean, they have, when they are butterflies, not little caterpillars, they have a proboscis, which is like a tube that they furl up when they're not Mm -hmm. eating, which means they also love things like bee balm, honeysuckle, columbine, anything that they can get that that tube into. Do you know that, Edith, that butterflies taste with their feet? No. So they first figure out with their feet if they like the plant or not before the proboscis will go in. And I also learned this too, is that uh, some adult male butterflies do not poop. Really? That they use all their energy. So there's nothing left to poop. Exactly. You know, I found out a poop fact (laughs) about butterflies. Oh no, why did I bring this up? Okay, go ahead. (laughs) They love poop tea. Which is manure tea. Oh, yeah. 
because it provides them minerals and mm -hmm. you need to have a source of mm -hmm. water for them, which I actually did not really realize. Well, you know, what I learned about the water source is that, well, they first they call it, um, they call it a puddling station for butterflies. Uh -huh. And they don't need water for um, for hydration because they get all that from the nectar that they drink. But they they need it to get the minerals that their body needs. And you can make a little puddling station in your yard, which is going to be different than like if you have a bird bath out. Uh -huh. You want something that's like a saucer low to the ground that has water, but also has mixed in with some soil. Uh -huh. So some rocks and some dirt, uh -huh. just soil, just mix in with soil from your yard. And so the rocks, so they have a landing place. Mm -hmm. Something shallow. And it, so that it creates a watery type of mud. And that they will use that to get the minerals that they need. That's a little nice. puddling station. So like if even if you have like a little terracotta saucer. Yeah, that's all it would take, huh? And keep your eye on it, especially during the uh, hottest parts of the summer. Some of the some of, some of the things that, that pre prey on uh, butterflies, spiders, rodents, birds, snakes. Sure, circle of life, right? Circle of life. Uh, speaking of that. When you see a little caterpillar and it has the same colors as a monarch or as a grown butterfly, that c caterpillar will turn into a butterfly. I mean, there was a time where I didn't really realize that and I was just killing caterpillars left oh, and right. yeah. Or a moth too, which are also important. Yeah. Yes. yes. So you have to, you have to feed the caterpillar and then you have to provide nectar for the grown butterfly. What and you may ask why is that important besides just the beauty of the butterfly? But butterflies are pollinators, just like bees are, which yes, we'll they talk are. about later yes, they on. Are. But they will help pollinate uh, other flowers and our food sources. Yeah. And one more thing that I found out, I found out that there's such a thing as a butterfly house. Yeah. But I also found out that they don't work. <laughs> So you don't waste your money, folks. It's Three the same person sites. who invented the pet rock, invented the butterfly house. Exactly. Yeah, try exactly. to think of other ways that you can have a nice habitat for butterflies by they love, planting the flowers that they like. They love trees. Mm -hmm. They love to. I saw a beautiful butterfly, huge, just sitting up in a tree, in, in my uh, plum tree. Oh, he's dead now, but not the butterfly, the tree. But I do have a peach tree. And that's another thing, fallen fruit. Yes, I've heard they that. They love that. I've seen them on my fallen peaches. So don't think about it. you have to have a very neat yard all the time. No. Because if the, the messier, not the, well, you know, I mean, the less, the more, allow a little chaos in your yard to help it's butterflies. A natural, it's a natural that. chaos. And Edith, as we're wrapping up butterflies, do you ever get um, the hummingbird moth in your yard? Um. I'm not sure. Do you? It's the yes, it's the strangest looking moth type. It looks like a, it might be like a large bee or maybe people think it's a version of a hummingbird. Yeah. And I actually posted one in my yard. I posted a video of it on our Facebook page. Um, and folks, if any of you have get hummingbird moths, also called hawk moths, they're the most amazing little, little critter to have in your yard. Just fascinating. Oh, that's sweet. Now time for more. Who killed Rosemary? Dun, 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 dun. Previously on Who Killed Rosemary. She was fine the day before. Life was finally perfect. And now she is dead. The authorities cannot rule out foul play. <gasps> Did Rosemary have any enemies? John Elway. Antelope Tuomi's Feed and Poetry Store, where the feed is hunky-dory and the poetry reading is mandatory. She used to have a thing with this squirrel. They were awfully chummy for the longest time, and then they just seemed to break up, and that squirrel hasn't been around in a long time. Die! 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 For Upside Down Tulips, I am Misty Contour, and this is Who Killed Rosemary. This squirrel was not easy to find. There were no public records on him. Every time someone thought they saw him at a bird feeder or a strawberry patch, it turned out I just missed him. 
I learned he used a frequent Edith's garden a lot last year. He and Rosemary were known around the neighborhood to be quite the pair. These days, he's been seen hanging out in surrounding pumpkin patches. I finally tracked him down a few blocks from Edith's house in a backyard where a volunteer pumpkin vine was growing out of a neglected compost bin. Hello, me pretty. Let me just give you a cuddle. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Let's give him pumpkin to talk about. <laughs> mm -hmm. Sorry to interrupt, but we need to talk. Well, what's this an idea? Misty Contour? I love your podcasts. <laughs> about time you caught up with me. Is this about the tomatoes, the tulip bulbs, the moblets? It's about rosemary. <gasps> Excuse me, my darling pumpkin pie. <laughs> Let's pick up where we left off later. Ah, rosemary. My old love. We had some good times, me and her. It's a shame what happened to her. A real shame. People are saying that your breakup was not very amicable, that you may have held a grudge against Rosemary. People can talk all they want. I loved her. I truly did. Nothing ever made me feel as fresh and alive like Rosemary. What happened? It just all became too much. Toxic, even. I had to move on. She knew. One thing about old Rosemary... She was smart. Maybe she was too smart. I don't appreciate the tone you are taking, Misty Contour. I've concluded this interview is over. And if you don't mind, I have a pumpkin to enjoy. <laughs> Come here, baby. I left the squirrel with an uneasy feeling in my gut leaving me with more questions than answers. Was I being threatened? Have I gotten too involved? Was the squirrel not telling me something? What was he covering up? Like the way a cover of mulch can improve your garden. Want to control weeds? Mulch it. Want to retain moisture? Mulch it. Want to prevent disease from splashing up on your plants? Mulch it. When in doubt, get some mulch and mulch it today. Use promo code an uneasy feeling in my gut. Or was he a murderer? If you have any information related to the death of Rosemary, please email UpsideDownTulips at gmail.com. Thank you for listening and tune in for upcoming episodes. Christy, do you realize what we just did? What? We put a podcast within a podcast. <laughs> no, I love <laughs> it. Yes. <laughs> yeah, very cool. Okay. So meta. So now we're, oh no, that then you're, you're saying it's so Facebook. Oh. That is not destroyed. <laughs> yeah. Oh, so Facebook. So let's so let's talk about bees. We friggin' love bees. Now, speaking of collective nouns, some people know a grouping of bees. A buzz a, of bees, right? Is a swarm. Oh, a swarm. I thought you'd like this also, that it's also called a bike of bees. A bike? B-I-K-E? Yeah. I don't know. You don't think about like bees riding little baby bikes. Right, but it actually comes from an old English word, bike, B-I-K-E, which means a colony, a nest, or a swarm, a bike of bees. And I wonder if that predates the actual bicycle. Yeah, I think so. That's so interesting. Yeah. Love words, huh? Yeah. Do you know that only female bees can sting? I did know that, yes. And that um, bees can fly 20 miles an hour. That's very fast. That's that very good. 80% of the world's flowering plants need a pollinator, like a bee or a butterfly, to um, reproduce, and that most of our food comes from flowering plants. Yeah, and um, we can get specific here. We can talk watermelons, cantaloupe, cucumbers, pumpkins, eggplant, hot peppers, and gourds have to have bees to pollinate. If they don't have that, you're not getting any, any fruit, no vegetables. One out of Every three bites of our food is created with the help of pollinators. In fact, tomatoes, although they are self-pollinating, 
they have better fruit and they set seed better if if they visited by a bee. Wow. So it's even good for people that people. <laughs> I'm talking about tomatoes being people. And one of the crops they're very, very worried about because of the drop of bees in the world is coffee. Oh. Oh, I, I, I don't think I could live without coffee. <laughs> I really don't think I could. Um, another is chocolate. Chocolate, I could live without more than coffee. <laughs> so, But there goes my mocha. Yeah. There are um, four, almost 4,000 bee species in North America. Now, when we, when, and when we talk about bee species, you sh- folks, if bees live in different zones, so if you're interested, find out which bees are in your zone, and you can do that by calling your agricultural extension at your local state university. It's important because what you plant sometimes depends on what species of bee is going to visit your yard. Um, an, an example of where people think would be a really great plant to have for bees and butterflies uh-huh. is butterfly bush. Because it sounds like you want to have it. And actually that plant is not native to North America. It is native to Asia and it is considered invasive in many states in the United States. Um, it is a prolific uh, reproduction rate, and so it'll crowd out other plants. Mm-hmm. And it only, what mm-hmm. they say is that even though it provides a lot of nectar for bees and for butterflies, um, they consider it to be just a, a like like cheap fuel, though, because it doesn't provide anything else for like bees and butterflies. Like a candy bar, huh? Yes. Yeah. yeah. And it even though it has the color that bees like, because bees like colors that are blues and yellows and purples, and also, I didn't know this too, they love white. Huh. So I'm very wow. excited about those white marigolds that I That's got. That's right. So it'll oh, be interesting yeah. to see what bees will, how bees will do on that. Um, and a great place to find out what native plants are good for your native bees would be like almost every state will have an, an organization called Native Plant Society. Mm-hmm. In fact, the Colorado Native Plant Society, which is cnps.org, I was able to look up to see all the native plants that would attract native bees. Because this is just, I mean, it's just evolution. It just means that's the way that this area has been for, you know, hundreds mm-hmm. and thousands of years. Mm-hmm. Well, it's So too- you would have, in your own state, you, you most likely will have a native plant society. Well, let's do a little checklist about like the big things you should or should not do if you want to to help Mm -hmm. with the bees. I think the first thing is, if you're going to use a pesticide, use an organic approved one. Yes. If you use one that is not a pesticide or an herbicide, you're going to kill your bees. And why spend all this time inviting bees and butterflies into your yard just to kill them? Exactly. And, And even before you reach for that spray... You know, can just consider what could be some um, non-spray alternatives. In fact, on our website, we have some natural sprays you can do. But let's, before you reach and start carpet bombing mm-hmm. things, consider what could be some, sometimes a spray of water is enough to get rid of yeah. some yeah. some things, so, so, some bugs that are wrong in your garden or things that are, you know. And another thing regarding pesticides, Edith, is I think... It's a different mindset about um, uh, allowing a little bit more chaos in your yard, allowing it to just be a little wild. You know, these extremely manicured, perfect yards, I don't think are worth it. And I also feel like, you know, um, good is not the enemy of perfect. And perfection in your yard, you're just going to, if you're trying to have perfection, you're just going to be disappointed all the time. It's also, it's a nice idea, speaking of, you know, not the perfect organized yard. It's a nice idea to plant vegetables and then plant flowers among them because the flowers Mm -hmm. will attract butterflies and bees as will a lot, which you need for the vegetables. If you let some vegetables go to seed, that means that you are feeding the bees for way, way longer. That is such a great point. Like, my, I remember bro- my broccoli went to seed and I just let it go. And Bees love that, don't they? In the fall. Oh, they my were, goodness. You know what else they love that I was surprised? The tassels on corn. 
They oh, were all that's over cool. that. It's so fun when you see a plant like undulating with bees, isn't it? Yeah. They love when you let onions go to seed. That, that includes chives. Um, and I noticed that too because I let that stuff go to Might seed. Might because they have a white flower. Aha. Uh-huh. It could one be. Thing I, one thing I learned about bees is that they can't differentiate red from the green of the plant. So they're not highly attracted to red plants at all, mm-hmm. which is the opposite of a hummingbird. You know, hummingbirds yeah. love red. Bees, they do not. Um, a couple of years ago, I started planting flowers, a border around my vegetable garden. Mm-hmm. And I did it mostly for, because I thought it would look pretty. Uh huh. But little did I know how much it was going to help. Yeah. So folks, if you ever have, I think squash is probably one of the more common things that will not um, produce. Produce. If you ever have that, it be plant flowers nearby, especially flowers. I, I have planted a lot of bachelor buttons around my uh, vegetable garden, and then I also do calendula. Blue. I did this by accident. Must have been something deep down inside that knew it. Blue, orange, and yellow. Wow. Or you're a huge Broncos fan. <laughs> of that, too, of oh, course. That too. Now, if maybe you just have a lawn. Do you know that if you have a lawn, you can help attract bees by letting clover grow, which is becoming more of a thing now anyway, and it's a great thing. If you have a really teeny tiny garden, you can help things by, you can grow things up. Like, they love, um, what is that, not morning glory, what is that beautiful yellow... Honeysuckle is what I was going oh, for. Oh, yes. Oh, my gosh. Great. I have a honeysuckle. They are all completely all over that. Consider using hanging baskets. Consider pots. Consider window baskets. All that stuff will Even also if you have a balcony, bees. Edith. Hmm? You have a balcony. If you have Imagine a balcony. Imagine if mm-hmm. everybody in your apartment building had one plant. That's a great right? idea. One sunflower. Yeah. Right? You would be creating a mm-hmm. field for bees. What about fruits? They love blueberry, raspberries. Raspberries, yeah. Love it. They were all... So there's so many things you can do. Um, Even in a really... With a really small piece of land. And if you have a big lawn, in addition to letting clover grow, might I also suggest slowly just cutting away at your lawn. Yeah. Some people call the lawn green deserts when it comes to pollination. Mm-hmm. And, you know, as what I try, I have a lawn, but every year I scoop a little more of it away, little here, little there, so you have more room for flowers. Yeah. Also, bee houses do seem to work. Yeah. yeah. We both have we both bee have houses. Them. And yeah. I have to say, I was a little dubious on them, but then... What I discovered is that, and this is one reason why you need to have, make sure you have good water sources, not just for your butterflies, but also for your bees, is that uh, mason bees will take mud and they need water and soil to make their make their little homes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So folks, we beg of you to have a bike of bees. What was the other one? A swarm of bees. A bike a of bees. A swarm, a bike of them. Uh, increase your native plants reduce the use of pesticides Mm -hmm. or eliminate entirely provide uh, some water sources yeah and you'll get your bees christy edith knock knock who's there the mailman ring ring (laughs) because the mailman always rings Rings twice. twice Today, we have a letter from Catherine from Denver, and she's asking, of course, one of the most important questions any gardener will have. She asks, when should I start planting tomato seeds for planting this coming summer? I have several seeds left from an heirloom plant I really like. And at what temperature should I keep the seeds at? Thanks, Catherine. Okay, so she is talking about making little seed pots. Right? Yeah, and I think that happens too is that, you know, there's lots of different ways to grow tomatoes. You can, I mean, I will buy them in the store. I will also uh, winter sow some. Some people will try them starting early. Um, Our good friend Melanie, who lives down the street, will start tomatoes and often we're the recipient Mm -hmm. of her wonderful plants. And if you have a plant that you really like and you save the seeds from them, It's nice to be able to see if you can have more, don't you think? Absolutely. So when should you plant them? I think you, don't you kind of count backwards from, you plant them in a little pot in your house, but you count backward from when 
the time is to plant it in your garden, correct? Yes. Um, if you're going to start tomatoes inside, there are a couple little things that you need to be successful, which is you want to make sure you have the right light. Normally, the light from your kitchen window is not going to be enough, in my opinion. I don't mm -hmm. know, Edith, if you agree with that or not. You know, I um, I don't know because I take mine outside and put them on the porch. Oh, that's gotcha. what I do, and I bring them in at night. And I also count back from the final frost date because of how much tomatoes love the heat. Mm -hmm. Right, and so like Catherine's asking too, like what temperature? And from what I know is that you know tomatoes like it warm, and so like if you keep your house at like sixty five degrees, that's not warm enough. You need to be keeping your house in the in the low seventies, right? Well, the way I do it, you know, I use one of those clamshells, mm -hmm. and so I put the little seed pots in there, mm. put them in the sun, because we have a lot of sun. You can't do this in every state, yes. but we have so much sunshine here. And then at night, I close the clamshell when I bring it in the house, and that traps the heat in there. So what, when would you normally start? Uh, I usually start too early, and then they get leggy, so I'm not yeah. going to do that this year. Yeah, I think, I think February's too early. and February's I think, too early, yeah. I think... Um, March sounds good. I'm going to start near the end of March. Yeah. Now, last year, I winter sowed tomatoes. And folks, this is an outdoor seed starting method. And I started, I think, too late. I uh -huh. started in April. And so I'm going to try in March. Yeah. So, right, Catherine, it's a, it's sort of like that crapshoot. Um, but, I, but I would recommend, if you're going to start inside, get some artificial light. That would be my recommendation. Mm -hmm. Or consider a heat mat also if you want to keep it warm enough. Um, and Chris, Chris, she also asks at what temperature should I keep the seeds at? Well, yeah. I keep my seeds in the garage. They get really cold and they don't seem to be. Oh, is that what she meant? That's See, what she's asking. I was wondering was if she meant like after she planted it, maybe she wanted all the information. So if it's after you plant it in the seventies, before you plant it. Yeah. I keep mine in my garage too. And yeah. they get cold. So if just the seeds unplanted, if that's what you mean, you just can do that any anywhere. That's yeah. okay. But if it's the seedlings, that's when you have to watch and make sure it's warm enough. So you're starting in March inside. Yeah. Uh -huh. I'm starting in March outside in milk jugs. Catherine, mm -hmm. let us know what you decide to do. And of course, I will always supplement with, I buy plants at my local nursery. Yeah, <laughs> me too. It's good to have tomato insurance. Oh my God, you know what? Yeah. Isn't it kind of yeah. exciting, Edith, to talk about tomatoes? Yeah. <laughs> I only have two jars left. Oh, wow. And I'm, and they're, I'm probably they're going to be gone in a couple months, and so I'm going to be out of fresh tomatoes. Yeah. And, that, and um, that's the best thing about gardening, I think, are tomatoes. Yeah. Next week, I'm going to bring something in that's going to surprise you. <gasps> it's a totally different way of preserving tomatoes, and we should open it up and see how good it is. Okay. They have been suspended in vinegar in a jar for months and months. Interesting. I'll bring, okay. it, in ne I'll bring it next week, okay? Okay. Well, Catherine, thank you so much for your wonderful letter. Please keep us posted. And folks, we want to hear from you too. What's going on in your gardens? What question do you have? What advice do you have for Catherine or for us? Please write to us at upside down tulips at gmail. Or, you could also go to our website, right? At upsetdowntulips.com. Mm -hmm. Christy's looking pensive, and I'm hoping that she's going to inspire us. This week's inspiration comes from Liberty Hyde Bailey, who was an American horticulturalist and instrumental in starting the 4-H movement. Here's his inspiration. A garden is half made when it is well planned. The best gardener is the one who does most of their gardening by the winter fire. A. Hey. That's what Very I'm doing good. these yeah, days. That's a good one. Planning by the winter fire. That's nice. I was a 4 H'er. Oh, that's so cute. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> heart with a head, heart, hands, health. Well, folks, thanks so much for listening. We are Edith Weiss and Christy Montour Larson. If you like us, if you got some value out of this, would you hit the subscribe follow button wherever you listen to your podcasts? Thanks so much to Denise Gentilini for composing and performing the Upside Down Tulips theme song. There's more. Go to denisegentilini.com. She's really amazing. 
or you can find that link at UpsideDownTulips.com. Thank you to the many talents of our kind friend, Karen Slack, as the squirrel. And thank you to our excellent yet enigmatic engineer. And a special thank you to our local nursery and friend of the show, Southwest Gardens. That's where I get all of my stuff that I need for the garden. Please join us next week for fun and easy tips on growing greens in your garden. And don't forget, if you make a mistake, your garden will forgive you. Upside down. And now let's flutter by. <laughs> or bike by if you're a bee. That's right. <laughs>